Um, thanks, Steve, and thanks, um, uh, thanks for the, uh, uh, the ability to talk about this research that we've been doing in Central Virginia following the, the mineral earthquake that happened in uh, August 23rd of 2011. And I'd, I'd really like to draw attention to my, uh, my co-authors here and funding from uh, uh, EarthScope uh, as, as part of a rapid grant uh, to get down on the ground and start looking at this area uh, in detail. So, you know, intraplate earthquakes are very, very poorly understood. And as a subset of intraplate earthquakes, you might want to consider uh, passive margins. And, and what, what makes passive margins very interesting to study from an intraplate perspective, I think, in part, is the, are the broader impacts. A large number of people live in large coastal cities on passive margins. And, and what these maps are showing is that globally, we've had some very large earthquakes, uh, historic earthquakes on passive margins. And, and there's a subset of those for the eastern United States. We've had some very large ones, of course, at Charleston and, and Cape Ann and, and the Grand Banks earthquake. And, and we also put the mineral earthquake up there as an important one. It was one of the most widely felt uh, events in the United States. Um, the Washington Monument is still closed. And of all things, to get on politicians' uh, agendas is when the Washington Monument is, has been closed for this long. The scaffolding just went up this week to, to repair it. In the central, um, in the, uh, the central Appalachians, or the, I should say the, the, the central um, uh, uh, East Coast passive margin of the United States, the, people have noted that there's been a clustering or an apparent clustering of earthquakes. And, and this, this diagram is showing you where some of those clusters are and where historically there's been perhaps seismic gaps. And these are the data, and you can see also located on here is the, is the, the, the Virginia earthquake. These data have been used primarily to, to generate these kinds of maps, which are what are the seismic hazards as a result of, of, of the, the, the observed seismicity. But I, I offer for your consideration th this following diagram, which was put together by uh, Bill Holt and, and, and very graciously shared with us, that he, this is a map, and, and the contours here are such that the, the strain rates, the high strain rates are in the cool colors. This is a map that's predicting from a geodynamic model with certain assumptions and parameters where the greatest strains are on the east coast of the United States. And, and this map looks different than the observed seismicity. And if these were the data that you were going to use to predict where the hazards might be, you'd make a, 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 a map that looks different than the one that I just showed you. And so it, it, it is interesting to note that, that the central Virginia area is predicted as one of the places where you would have high strain rates. And, and that, of course, is where, where we had our most recent large earthquake. Now, uh, following the earthquake, uh, a lot of groups got down onto the ground, got seismometers in the ground. And uh, what we're showing you here is one year's worth of, of data of collecting the aftershocks. And they define uh, this is the location of the aftershocks. And to kind of get you located, this right here is the James River okay, flowing down to uh, the fall zone. And this would be Richmond, Virginia, right here. And so here was uh, the earthquake itself. And you could see that they def these, these aftershocks very nicely define a fault plane. And that fault plane is dipping back to the southeast uh, quite steeply at about 50, 54 degrees or so. And it has, has a strike length of about 10 kilometers. There is no surface rupture that we've been able to identify with the fault or with the earthquake. Um, but we would, uh, we would suggest that there would be something on the order of 10 centimeters of slip for an earthquake of this size and for a strike length of about 10 kilometers just using average scaling relationships. Um, this has now been called the quail fault uh, by a number of geologists and, and groups that have worked uh, in, in this area. And if we look at the geology, uh, this is work done by Stephen Hughes and Jim Hibbard, uh, as well as uh, the group at the um, uh, Division of Geology and Mineral Resources in the state of Virginia. The Quail Fault plots right in the middle of a terrain called the Chapawamsic terrain. It does not fall on any mapped major shear zone. It doesn't fall on any other mapped major fault. Uh, and you can see that up here on the geologic map. And then really interesting, along I-64, moving from the northwest to the southeast, here is the cross section. This is the reinterpreted cross section along the Route 64 corridor. And the so-called quail fault does not seem to nucleate on a mapped or interpreted 
uh, fault in that cross section, and it's dipping much more steeply than all of the other structures, which are these largely Ordovician age or, or Paleozoic age uh, thrust thrust faults. So it's really sort of intriguing as to as to what what actually ruptured in in. Uh, in August 2011, and the investigations are ongoing to try to describe that. Now, there's a couple of ways that you can get at this question of what would be the persistence of slip on a structure like the quail fault, should it exist as, as, as we think it does, and one would be to use GPS geodesy. This, this is just a map from the UNAVCO data archive to show you some of the, uh, the stations that are, are currently collecting uh, permanent GPS uh, data, and the data are available uh, to look at. Uh, these two stations right here are the ones that we were able to put in following the earthquake. One of them is on the hanging wall of the quail fault, the other is on the foot wall. That's what the stations look like, and we, we've heard a number of talks about this. These are PBO quality stations, and this opens up the, 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 the question, the broader discussion that I think we're having uh, throughout this meeting as to what would be the role of a, of a plate interior uh, observatory of, of stations of this quality. Uh, here are some of the data from that station. There's really nothing interpretable from this yet. It's, it's, it's noisy, and it's, I'm only showing you here just, just about one year's worth of data. But, but as, as these data, as, as they grow in time, uh, the argument would be that we, we might be able to start seeing a discernible signal um, from, from, a, uh, from a, a broader network. Now, the second way of getting at this question is what, is what is the persistence of slip would be to do geodesy, but use geomorphology to do it. This would be using doing paleogeodesy. And, and so I point out that this earthquake very nicely happened right along this river. This is the South Anna River. And um, uh, that's great from, a, from a, a, a geomorphic perspective because rivers are very sensitive indicators of active tectonics, both in their form as well as the deposits that they leave behind in the form of uh, terraces. Um, this is the projection of the quail fault, and I draw your attention to the fact that the stream upstream of the quail fault is, has a very low sinuosity, very straight channel. At about the town of Yanceyville and downstream of the quail fault, it's, very, very, it's highly sinuous. And, and, and this is very intriguing because we know that one of the responses of, of rivers to very subtle tectonic perturbations is that when the valleys are being steepened because of uplift, uh, the rivers will take a longer path, and that longer path is associated to, to lower their gradient, and that's associated with the higher sinuosity. So it's very intriguing, in fact, that that sinuosity change happens right here in the earthquake area where uh, the quail fault is projected uh, to the surface. But um, more intriguing than the sinuosity change would be the fact that there's two other observations. One is that all along the, the South Anna River, we find these river terraces. So they're very nice gravel deposits, stratified gravels. We can go into the landscape and we could map these things. And here's just a couple pictures of those gravels. And in addition to that, we find these bedrock uh, rapids or bedrock steps. These, these are things that we call nick points. And these are also very intriguing as to why this zone around the earthquake is characterized by so many of these uh, bedrock steps. Now, the way we typically plot this up, this is a very simple plot. Um, this is a long profile of the South Anna River, and it's just a plot of the distance of the river versus its elevation. And we can see that it, it actually occurs in several segments. This red segment up here very nicely follows a pattern of decreasing channel slope with drainage basin area. That's a very normal pattern. And we could use that. We can describe this, this pattern here to talk about the, um, the concavity of the river as well as its steepness. And we could use that to predict what the overall long profile used to look like. Downstream, the river is convex. And this is because of base level fall that happens at the fall zone and has been propagating through the landscape for literally many millions of years. In this zone where the earthquake happened, I'm not even showing you the data because it's, um, it's really a mess and th there's no coherent pattern here at all. But if we take that uh, slope area relationship from Bird Mill, where one of those big nick points are, and we project it downstream, we would say that that's what the long profile of the South Anna looked like prior to the base level fall. And what we would say is that the river was moving gravel and it deposited gravel along that profile, along its floodplain. 
And then the base level fall occurs and it moves through the river profile and it leaves scraps of that gravel behind that we map as river terraces. So we would predict that the river terraces of the South Anna River should fall right on this line that we're, we're, we're predicting, we're showing right here. So if we go into the landscape and we make a map, and this is a very, very, this is actually not a map, this is just a, a cartoon of a map that we're in the process of making of, of where these river terraces are, we find that, they're in two, that they exist all the way here from the Bird Mill site through Yanceyville down to the town of South Anna. There's the earthquake location, there's the Quail Fault. And they occur at two different elevations, one in orange relatively close to the stream, another one a, a couple of uh, 10 meters or 15 meters higher that I'm plotting here in green. If we now take those terrace deposits and we plot them on the long profile, this is what we find. And, and very interesting, we see that uh, basically in, upstream of and in the vicinity of Yanceyville, the terraces are falling right on the predicted elevation of, of where they should be on the reconstructed long profile of the South Anna River. And that's true both for this lower part of the reconstructed profile as well as for uh, the upper one. What it doesn't predict very well is that if this is the quail fault, as suggested by uh, its projection to the surface in the geologic studies, it would suggest that the quail fault is not doing much to offset those terraces, because those terraces are falling exactly where we would expect them to fall. But interestingly enough, when we put the whole terrace data set on there, we come downstream just a little ways, we would say, wow, th those terraces are not falling on the predicted line. In fact, they do look like they are offset. And they're offset by some, somewhere between six and 10 meters. Now, I know a lot of you work in active tectonic places where six or 10 meters is like within the error of, of a measurement on a topographic map. And that's true here too, but this is really a big deal for the East Coast. I don't know of any other place on the East Coast where there's a geomorphic or stratigraphic horizon, of, a, a Pleistocene geomorphic or stratigraphic horizon that is, a, that is apparently offset this way. This is really a big deal. Now, we've, we've got to get into this landscape and we've got to do this in, more, in, in greater detail. We have to make the map correctly. This is based on really preliminary data. We have to make sure that we have the gravels mapped correctly. We have to double check their elevations. We have to make sure that we've done the correlation correctly. But if we have, it looks something like this. And, and if that's true, let's just put some broad numbers on here. We don't know the ages of these terraces yet. That's another thing that we have to do. We have to do the geochronology on that. If we trace the terraces all the way down to the coastal plain near Richmond, uh, we have broad constraints on their ages as they correspond to coastal plain deposits that are dated. And, and if we just play a game here, if, you know, if, if the terraces are offset, um, if they are a million years old, and, and they're offset by 10 meters, then this is a very slow rate of slip. It's, a, it's something like 0 0.01 millimeters per year. So the amount of relief that's being generated by that amount of slip is really quite slow, and we might never see that in the regional topography. You know, but if these terraces are younger than that, and, and I would tell you, looking at them, I would say they're old, but they're not a million years old. If they're a couple hundred thousand years old, now we're looking at slip rates that are something like a tenth of a millimeter per year. That's getting towards a, an increase of relief. That's 100 meters in a million years. You should see that relief. You should see that topography in the landscape if this fault has been here slipping in a persistent way. Um, so. With that, I'll just say that these are some of the preliminary results. It's very exciting. It seems that we have an offset geomorphic marker. Uh, we'd like to get in there and date this to see what the rates of slip actually are. And I think this is a, a, an important topic of conversation that's coming up in some of our breakouts. So there's a breakout session that's going to be devoted to uh, uh, some of these topics in Eastern North America. And I think we're going to see this issue come up again uh, in terms of what a, what a geodetic network might or might not be able to tell us for a place, a passive margin uh, in the IGNITE sessions. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm.